Welcome to the Ancient Way Podcast, where we discuss what it looks like to live as a Gentile following a Jewish Messiah. Put simply, we want to help others rediscover an ancient way by embracing the Jewishness of Jesus. We're glad you're here. Jim, it's so good to see you today. I'm excited. Um, As we've been preparing, uh, we're talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread today. And I got really excited as we were preparing for this. And uh, just for a little bit of review for everyone listening, we've been talking about the Feast of Passover uh, for the last few episodes. And uh, Passover um, and what we'll get into with the Feast of Unleavened Bread is really the second of seven feasts of Adonai. And one thing, Jim, we were talking about is the literal Hebrew word for feast, or uh, it's often translated as an appointed time, is a moed, yeah. right? So we're talking about a moed, and uh, maybe you're familiar with the word moedim. Uh, this just means the plural form of moed. Right. So when we're talking right. about these seven feasts of God, feasts yeah. of the Lord, feasts of Yahweh, these are his moed, his moedim. So, right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, so I grew up in New York and um, a, a tremendous concentration of uh, Jewish population there in, in, in New York. So that Jewish holidays, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur were always off, always. That was just, you know, it was a, mm. and being, a, I was raised Catholic. So these were the, um, it was just a day off of school because uh, this holiday that Jewish people were celebrating. So I've always felt that they were the quote unquote Jewish holidays as if they were part and parcel with the religion in any ways, obviously it was. But when you said the feasts of Adonai, they're his feasts. They right. matter to him. He directed them. He said they were important to him. So me as a believing Christian, uh, a Christian believing upon Jesus Christ in a, in a personal way, this God really holds these as holy unto himself from himself like they emanated from him and they're holy to him well that gives me as a gentile an entirely different awe of what they actually are because i'm in awe of the god who wrote them right and uh i don't believe you know so uh, there's there's some national uh pastors you know televangelists if you will but they're, they're pastors of the church who say the old ways are gone. The, Jesus changed everything. Yeah, but they mattered to him. And right. uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't. We, I, I am certainly not espousing that everyone needs to become Jewish because they became Christian. But I do say, find out about these. They matter to our Father. Right. That's and and and, and ultimately, that's why you and I are here. Are, are, isn't that true, John? Yeah, totally. I think the way I started to approach it. Because I've had people ask me, like, are you trying to become Jewish? And yeah. like you're saying, the answer is no. But when I look at the life that Yeshua lived, that Jesus lived, he's celebrating these these times. He's following his father and yeah. recognizing the way that he's uh, called him to live. And And when I think about my own life, I want it to reflect that. So me celebrating this is me trying to figure out, how do I follow Jesus the way that he lived his life? And how do Amen. I try to know God in the way that he did? And Amen. I don't know, for me, the the feasts are one of those things that has filled all of these things up with meaning. And uh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So we're here today with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Do you, do you want to talk about this yes. particular feast? Yeah, so we're going to get into some specifics on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, but as we were kind of preparing for this, uh, what kind of struck me, and I think worth mentioning, is that technically, uh, when we read about this, which we will in a little bit, uh, in Leviticus 23, Passover kicks off the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes. And so it's actually the the Feast of Unleavened Bread that is the feast. So it starts with Passover, and then it goes right into a seven-day period of time. So it lasts a whole week. It starts with the Shabbat. It ends with the Shabbat. And yeah, there's like a tremendous amount of significance in in here. And so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about what this means um, in the scheme of history. We're going to talk about the the Exodus narrative and how we approach God uh, as a holy God and what that means for us. And right. 
I think that really centers on this idea of hametz or leaven, right? So when we we hear the name, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? We think of bread as like fluffy and soft, but because of Passover, they couldn't have leavened in it. In it. They didn't have time for the bread to rise. And right. We're going to look at, well, what does this, what does this actually mean? What are some things that we can parse out from this? So I'm excited for, yeah, what we're going to dive into today. And Jim, one of the things we started talking about was how this fits into the larger story overall. Right. Are, you, are you asking me to t- talk about that larger story? Yeah. Like, I think that would be great oh, right. as we like dive into the Feast of Unleavened Bread to just kind of show some of the significance of uh, of some of the feasts and, you know, what may be looked at as Jewish tradition, but what that really Absolutely. means for us today is, as Gentile Absolutely. followers. I think this is of particular interest to Gentiles who are trying to explore how does this matter to me? And if it did, how do I, how do I engage it? So we, we see, um, we just finished our, our series about the Passover and the Passover Seder. How do you do a Seder and all the nuances and the, the gorgeous little tidbits of prophetic um, views to Jesus, Yeshua, what have you. Um, so the, 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 Pace, the, the Passover Seder is a lot like, if in, it, so the, you celebrate the Passover of the Jews leaving is Egypt in a Jewish way, but the Gentile corresponding reality is this is us accepting Christ as a savior. You know, I, you know how many d- different ways do we refer to that? But this is someone saying, I believe in Jesus accept his sacrifice for me. I'm now a Christian. I've committed my life to him. That's the Seder. That's putting your right. hand on the lamb, covering your doorpost with the blood of the lamb, not escaping death, the, the, the big death, the eternal one, by virtue of this lamb. And then you had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, this would be in a Jewish timeline. This is in a, It's a big deal getting rid of all the leaven and all that stuff. Uh, yep. But the Gentile parallel is um, that process of sanctification. You get saved, you're still smoking dope, you're still you know, out in the clubs, you're <laughs> like, what? and then you start to confront the fact, oh my God, this is sin. It's a sin right. and you have to actually repent. And uh, you go through this process of the Holy Spirit revealing, you know, so, so many of us put down the, the obvious sins at the point of salvation, but at, along the way, he reveals where's all the sin in your life. Not that he's out browbeating you to make you, of his wonder, of his goodness, and transforming your life from this broken thing to a holy thing. And that's exactly what the entire... So, like, this is a festival that lasts for a week. Because why? It's a pr- Sanctification is a process. Yes. And that's what we're going through as we walk with oh, man. Uh, the Lord. And then um, with this Feast of Unleavened Bread, you uh, you know, the, he, the Word is telling us, uh, make yourselves clean. There's some implication where they cleanse themselves through water, um, a mikvah, which would be the Hebrew term. Right. And um, while it's not explicit, it's there if you want to, right. to see it. And uh, to me, you're a Gentile. You get saved. You're going through sanctification. At some point, you want to choose to be baptized. Because, I mean, Jesus said, let me do, you know, you don't, you're right. You have no business baptizing me. However, let me do this that everything's done right. So the, baptism is a thing. Some denominations make it, you know, the big thing. Other people just say, yeah, it's this nice thing, you know, and we're not even going to go there. We're just saying baptism is a significant milestone in the journey. It looks just like the Jews making themselves clean for this festival as they also clean their houses, their households of leaven. Right. And then we, um, the next holiday on the, on the, uh, that we're going to look at is Shavuot. And so, so historically, this is where the law was revealed. But to a Gentile, that same feast, Shavuot is what we call Pentecost when the Holy mm. Spirit was given. So in ancient times, the law was given. What does righteousness actually look like in brass tacks? Oh, 613 rules. That's what it looks like. So in God is now based upon the, well, in Jesus, it's based upon the blood of the, of the ultimate lamb of God. And right. the Holy Spirit is given. And uh, we, we see 3,000 people dying on the first Shabbat, we see 3,000 people in Jerusalem mm. coming to salvation on yeah, that that's same a great holiday. Parallel. So now we have the law brings death and the spirit brings life. And it's God's, it's, it's, like, it's like you're being read to by our Heavenly Father. And, he tar- mm. you know, and I, I gave the Torah to the, my people and I taught them what does righteousness look like. And I handed them my moed, my feast that mattered to me. And then he turns the page and then Yeshua showed up. 
<laughs> and on this one, I gave you the Holy Spirit mm. to dwell inside of you, to change everything. So like, that's why these feasts are so personally important to a Gentile or could and yes. should be so terribly important to a Gentile because th we're, we're actually walking through his, his chapters of his book of how he made mankind his again, what it took for him, what it asked of us. Here we are in showcase mm. and feasts. So good. I love it. I, what I love, like even hearing you talk about this and, and we're getting ahead of ourselves with Shavuot, but there's such a there's such an alignment, right, where, where God does these amazing things in the course of history aligned with his appointed yeah. times, like the times where he wants to show up. And yeah. that's like what is I don't know. It's just crazy to me as we we continue to celebrate and keep the feast, like what the Lord just continues to reveal through his spirit. And yeah. man, it's so good. Like, I hope every, like, I want more people to experience this because it's yeah, so good. Truth. Yeah. You know, I came to a saving knowledge of Christ in 1972. And somewhere in the, in the first couple of years, there was this Jewish guy who became a believer and he was quite the anomaly at the time. And he wrote this pamphlet. I, I have it actually somewhere. Uh, he goes, you know, all the feasts point to Yeshua, to yes. Jesus, and, and, and they tell his story. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I just, <laughs> I was too shallow to get it. Right. And here I am all these later years, like decades later, living the wisdom he had. Well, um, 50 years ago, wow. he had the wisdom to, to like, and that's what like, Jews for Jesus were becoming a thing. And they were like, right. suddenly there was these, pockets of Jewish people believing upon Yeshua within a Jewish context. They weren't becoming Christian. They were not coming to church. No, no. Right. They were living their Jewish life with an idea that the Messiah had, in fact, shown up. And uh, the light they gave us. But, you know, honestly, it was like light shines in the darkness and the darkness just doesn't get it. That was me right there. I did not. <laughs> I thought it was, well, that's an interesting perspective. But right. <laughs> I had no idea that I was encountering the living God with a revelation. I was just too mm. dull at the, you know, mentally or spiritually dull at the time, or perhaps immature for me to grasp. But here we are living it. Man, I, I love what you just said, too, where you said, essentially, uh, the feasts are a, an opportunity to experience the living God. Yes. And I love that because that's what I found true in my experience where, yeah. you know, you might approach it feeling strange and weird, but I feel like every time I've, I've like come into it in, with intentionality, the Lord showed up and he showed me something new about himself and his character and the way he wants me to live. And man, yes. I, I just, I can't walk away from those experiences unchanged. It's so good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this takes us to like, let's talk about the feast of unleavened bread. And I mentioned this earlier, but it's, it's a continuation of Passover where Passover is the beginning of the feast of unleavened bread. And this comes from Leviticus uh, 23. Uh, we're going to read five through eight, where it says during the first month on the 14th day of the month in the evening is Adonai's Passover. So we've got Passover starting here, but then the very next verse, it says on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of matzo or the feast of unleavened bread to Adonai. For seven days, you were to eat matzah. On the, seventh, on the first day, you were to have a holy convocation, and you should do no regular work. Instead, present an offering made by fire to Adonai for seven days. And on the seventh day is a holy convocation where you do no regular work. So essentially, it's saying, you're going to, right after Passover, you're going to have a Shabbat. Don't do any work. Rest. Like, rest in God's presence. And then you're going to feast for seven days, and you're going to end it with another Shabbat. Right. And... This is great. So, so what this immediately, I think, calls to mind for me is the matzah, because this is what is central to this feast. Mm -hmm. And we kind of touched on this in a past episode where uh, the Israelites were essentially eating so quickly as God has, uh, as they're eating the, the Passover uh, meal, they don't have time to wait for the dough to rise. So this is why matzah is central. But I think it's a lot more than that. It's deeper than that. Um, matzah is not something we talk about often, uh, especially in like Western American culture as a Gentile. But matzah is kind of like a flatbread. Um, it doesn't have time to rise. Uh, sometimes I think it tastes like a like a saltine cracker or something yeah, like that. No so question. if you haven't seen it, this is what it is. But the importance of it 
is that in scripture, it's saying there is no hametz. Hametz is a Hebrew word for leaven. And I think as we look at this, it's synonymous for, for sin. And we see yeah. this in some of the Jewish traditions where uh, right before the Feast of Unleavened Bread has this tradition of going through the whole house and they're searching for any like piece of leaven. They're throwing out bread, uh, probably getting rid of challah if they have it. Uh, as as a reminder, like we need to be introspective and look at our lives in this season and say, what is it that might be in our lives that God wants to deal with, that he wants us to get rid of? Um, so, yeah, I I like this this tradition. Jim, I know you've got some maybe haven't uh, participated in, in this way. So I'm curious what's coming to mind as you hear me talking about getting rid of the hamets. Well, I, let me let me offer a little aside. So many of the, this holiday is bookended with Shabbat, and mm. just about every time you encounter God on His terms by His description, Shabbat, the rest that we find in Him is always there. It always opens it. It closes it. It's that's a great it's point. One of His messages to us, like you know, Jesus said, "Come unto me. My burden is light. My yoke is easy." Um, He's very much about separating us from the burdens of life and coming into the rest of his love and kindness. Mm. And as you encounter, even here in this releasing of sin, you know, like, like for me, I was such a rebellious kid that for me, he was like the cosmic killjoy. What? This also is a sin? You've got to be kidding me. But um, he's not. He's always inviting you to be, come under his come on, put your head on his chest and rest from this thing of life. And mm. here, this holiday is no, even in the sanctification process, it's bookended with my rest, which oh, I so good. love. Okay. Um, so you want my personal, <laughs> I thought we were saving this to the end, but I will tell you, um, I, I don't see me doing this. Um, I really respect it. I really admire it. But am I really going to throw out my sourdough bread and all that stuff? Yeah, probably not. Um, that said, that's the way I felt about Shabbat. That's the way I felt about uh, the Seder. <laughs> I did a couple. They were very boring. Then I did it with you. And the Holy Spirit was, you just could have cut it with a knife. It was just so rich and so present. And it was so beautiful that I imagine I would be doing a Seder for the rest of my life. So. I look at this and um, my sin has been paid for. I'm not really looking to get rid of sin because A, it's been covered and B, I'm walking through this sanctification process as a Christian, not wringing my hands thinking I have fell short again. No, my heavenly father's in love with me and he walks me down the path and the sin that he showed me, he deals with and it, then it's gone. And uh, lo and behold, here's a brand new layer. I didn't understand then mm -hmm. I engage that. So like I live like this I don't feel the need to go through the rigors of the practical walking out. Do I respect Israel as they do? Well, certainly, certainly they're, they're teaching the world as, as they should, as is, is their command. They're showcasing God to the entire world. And it, this is almost like drama. It's, it's almost like we live out a story. It's like, it's like the prophet who married Gomer. Like he was married right. to, a whore, basically, and it was, uh, God was saying, this is what it's like married to a people that keep going away from me. Mm. So God often showcases his heart. So Israel here is showcasing another facet of why it's so wonderful to walk with him. Do I then as a Gentile feel compelled to do this particular holiday in this way? Yeah, no, I don't. I really don't. And, and maybe I will. You know, I, I can't say that it's always it's always come down to a point of my own <laughs> ignorance, the light shining in the darkness, the darkness not getting it. I might be there again, and maybe in this, the future I'll be doing this, but no, I won't be doing this right away. That's great. Well, I think <laughs> I think what like in the vein of what you're saying, what's important is that we trust that God's spirit is working, and so He's going to lead us in the path that we need to take. And I I truly believe that. Right. the The one thing that that really stood out to me. Um, in fact, I was I was reading this this week, uh, kind of unrelated to preparing for this this conversation on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But it's in Exodus 13. And I feel like this kind of ties into the, the approach you were taking of 
like when God tells you to do something, it's, it's a good thing, right? It's not like he's right. trying to withhold anything from you. But it says this in Exodus 13, 3, where Moses is talking to the people. Uh, and he's saying, remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by a strong hand, Adonai brought you out from this place. No mm-hmm. hamets may be eaten. And then he goes on kind of repeating what we just read in Leviticus 23, right. where he says, for seven days, you're to eat matzah. Seventh day is to be a feast to Adonai. Matzah is to be eaten throughout the seven days. No hamets is to be seen among you, nor within any of your borders. So even though, you know, I'm hearing you say that's not something you're participating in. It's interesting to me that like it's prescribed here, like this is where the Jewish tradition comes from of getting rid of hamets. But the part that like it just I don't know, it like left off the page here is this next verse, Exodus 13, 8, where he says you were to tell your son on that day saying it is because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. So he's saying, uh, why? Like your kid's going to approach you and say, why are we doing this? Like, dad, why are you getting rid of the bread? What's the big deal? This is strange. And it just stands out to me that God's like, I want you to remember this moment of how I've delivered you for all time. And it's so important. I want you to do this again and again, year after year, so that you remember my faithfulness. And what I find fascinating is in this next verse, it literally is a nod to the the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, where it says, it will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder between your eyes so that the Torah of Adonai will be in your mouth for with a strong hand, Adonai has brought you out of Egypt. You are to keep this as a moed, that Hebrew word we talked about from year to year. And I, I find it fascinating, like how much God talked about this particular feast through Moses and how important it is for us to remember like how God has been faithful um, through the years. And he wants us to include our kids. (laughs) I might have to celebrate this. The, the, the other thing. So I'll just, I'll just keep going for a minute because I got like, I got really excited when I'm reading this because what, what it kind of like, if I could sum it all up is like you were talking about earlier, God delivered us. He redeemed the Israelite people. He's delivered us and he, he brings redemption in our own lives. But like you kind of touched on in the beginning, I just see this feast of unleavened bread as a reminder of that sanctification process where we, we have these old ways that we've been living that feel comfortable. And you see right. this kind of played out in the Israelites response to Moses where they're like angry at him. They're like, why did you lead us out here? Why did you take us into the desert? We had everything we needed in Egypt. And right. it's almost like God saying, I need you to have a period of time where I, I work out all of those things in your life that you no thought were good. And he's saying, let me show you a better way to live and let me yeah. help you reset these old ways of thinking, these old ways of living life, this life without me. And like, I can't unsee that now um, as I'm looking at this feast of unleavened bread. I'm, I'm sure what I'm about to say is a universal truth, but I'm going to speak it from a personal perspective. And that is every major area of sin that the Lord asked me to part with by virtue of his word, I felt robbed. I liked very much, mm. you know, the way I, I, the way I saw it, the way I did it, whatever. And in ret- when I look back, what he was really asking me for was my brokenness, was this place that I, I was living in a broken way. I was very comfortable. It's all I knew. I was happy, happy, happy. Felt robbed and out of worship, mm. aligned with his call. And now look back, I'm thinking, I had the privilege of worshiping him by giving up something I had no desire to give up, which was really a holy moment. But in retrospect, yeah. it was like I was giving him the rags I was wearing because he was trying to give me a tuxedo mm. or what have you, fine clothes. And right. um, now I think it's laughable what I thought I was giving up. But at the time, <laughs> right. I didn't feel that way. I really wanted to keep it. And then I, I we, and we're back in Egypt. I had leeks and onions. What am I? I'm here in the desert. I have this what, what, what's it bread to eat every day. And I'm complaining about what life in bondage actually looked like and losing it was what? So 
I've lived this a million times and, 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 and in reality, having an annual reminder of what it was to release the things I actually liked only to find out he wanted to give me, he wanted to empty my hands so that he could fill them with something so much better. Right. So this really would be an annual appointment with that remembrance. And um, I'm probably wrong again. <laughs> you know, it, it, it lets me go down the record that when he, when I'm actually celebrating the uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it, this is me, the, 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 the one, the, the one that's being dull as a light shines. But uh, I can't say that I'm honestly there yet. Yeah. But, I, and that's all, that's I, I all right. Like being, yeah. That's right, good. Go on. I love it. Um, well, yeah. So I think the other to like, I guess, paint one other aspect of this, this feast, like what, what I started seeing as I'm preparing for this is the fact that, uh, as we're talking about, I, it was a, a episode or two ago, we're talking about Yeshua and how he's sitting with his disciples at the last supper. But what may not be obvious right away is that his death and resurrection would have happened during the feast of unleavened bread. And so what kind of came to mind for me is how like through his sacrifice, he's preparing us. Um, he's making a way for us to, to remove and cover the sin that's in our lives and to make a way once and for all, um, through what he did on the cross. And like, I couldn't help but make that connection of how like he removes, you could say he removes the hamets, right? The, this, this metaphor of removing sin in our lives and, how a Yeshua as the Passover lamb um, is, is what's allowing this to happen. So it, it has to start with Passover. And then this is what's immediately following and how kind of like you talked about, like that process that follows our salvation is yeah. a time, like a progression of sanctification. Yeah. And so just tying that back into Yeshua um, yeah. was just kind so of staring me right in the face resolved our sin but we had a lot of habits associated with the sin that his that his blood covered and this sanctification process is that life that path you walk with him where you start to be relieved of your broken ways that you're all too comfortable with so um and you know isn't there it's also interesting that you have to go find it it's in your house go find it it's in Mm -hmm. your life recognize that this way you speak to such and such is actually a disgrace. You feel justified because they, or they never, or they always, and I feel justified, but he says, yeah, well, it's also sin. And right. it, yes, I covered it. Yeah, you are holy because I am holy. However, this has to stop. You need to embrace right. love and forgiveness and move out of the beauty, move into the beauty of heaven as you encounter this difficult person and stop justifying this. So like, it, it's looking for the hamets. It's looking, <laughs> yeah. and, and, it, and it's having the nerve what my favorite cookies have leaven? Oh my God. I have to throw this out. Like, you know, like it, right. it looks just like sanctification in, in my opinion. It totally does. Well, like what I'm thinking about now is right. How you, you were kind of describing you balk at that idea of throwing away bread, but it is like, I've never uh, approached it from how you just said it, but it's like, I do the same thing. Like we have this sourdough starter. I don't want to throw this out. I've worked really hard for this. Why do I have to get rid of it? And it's I'll that same house. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll bring it back when we're done. But isn't that just like us to, to want to do that? Like th- just the fact that I would feel that way about throwing out bread. I don't know. It just makes me rethink, um, like why the Lord might want us to go through that, uh, that process just to remind us of how we are. Starting sourdough bread every year after this festival <laughs> would not be my favorite. I need yeah. to know. So my wife does not like doing that. Does she do it? Well, we did it one year and she absolutely hated it. (laughs) And so I, I can't remember what we did last year and yeah, you'll have to ask me after we actually go through it this year to uh, (laughs) see what she does. Wow. And honestly, this, this brings in a whole other ball of wax, which we're not discussing. I repeat, we're not discussing (laughs) is you come to this revelation of God within the context of his Moedim, his appointed times. That doesn't mean your spouse is feeling the same way. Right. And here you are struggling. Like I, I am a Sabbath. I'm a Saturday Sabbath observer. My wife is not. She, she right. gave it a try. It wasn't for her. 
we do the Arab Shabbat, the Friday business together, and then she's done. She's going to, you know, shopping on Saturday or whatever it is she does. Um, this in particular would be quite the bone of contention for a couple struggling yes. with, uh, I believe this, she, she, or, and he thinks I'm out of my mind or, you know, vice versa. Um, is this going to save you? No, 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 no. Right. Is this part of the poetry our father views of life? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so we're not suggesting that your your salvation is your you know your salvation is a yes or no blood of Jesus, not blood of Jesus. It's just that simple. How you walk with him might might involve these stories. If in right. fact you want to cozy up to him, the very author of all things Hebrew. Mm. Um, so this is a hard one. This is a hard one for for a, a household. Is um, I would hate the idea of making sourdough starter every year, and this you know, that would just be like, oh yeah. And then, and then you also can't make bread for what two weeks until your starter's ready to rock and roll. But right, um, yeah. I I think you touched on something that's worth saying, right? Because there are going to be people who approach this from different ways. Some people might. Like you're saying like this, this I'm not, I'm not going to throw away my bread. This is crazy. And it's true. Like th this act does not save us. It is not our salvation. On the other yeah. hand, right. I found the, the process again, being a little more traditional than you are. This act like helps me center my mind on what God is doing and what he wants to do in my life. And I think out of all of those areas, it's really just the posture of our hearts and like at the very least, I think that's what I would encourage people to come to this feast with is recognizing like, hey, God, what do you want to do in my life in this season? Um, what are the things that maybe it's just acknowledging and remembering what he's done in your life, like you were describing earlier and being intentional about remembering that and being open to something that he might want to put his finger on that he might want to change. Right. No to me, that's no more important than the physical act of getting rid of, of bread. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I want to be careful not to characterize God as the uh, ancient of you missed a spot days. Um, but there's always something he's working on. You know, uh, like Jacob, I loved Esau. I hated Jacob had all kinds of convictions, all kinds of trials. And Esau didn't. And it's yep. like, God was focused on Jacob and not on Esau. Why? I don't know. That's just what it, the word tells me. Um, so that I, I would worry about the year you weren't aware of something he was moving on right now. Like, right. how are you, how are you, how is your connection so thin that he's not moving in some area that you know, you have to rise to or release or something like that. So totally. to me, this would be perennially apropos. Like it would always <laughs> fit for new reasons. Yep. Again, not that he's browbeating. And, and over here, this sin, and over here, that sin is, he's just right. not that. Although right. some of us have been raised to believe he is. I was for sure. Um, no, it's more like my father who says, yes. you know, this is nothing but bitterness in disguise the way you mm. engage this situation. And it's like, well, of course, I've got everybody. Yeah, I should do it. And it's also wrong. And uh, let me help you out of this, if you will. Let me help you out mm. of this. So there's always so that, always that. And right. I think this, this is, I'm hating this already. Um, um, this is probably a good time to revisit <laughs> this, the narrative mm. that his love makes possible. Yeah, I, I like, I, I, in what you're saying, I, I think that's, a good way to reframe the perspective, right? Because our, our views, our natural views of God don't always uh, come with this, right? And, and how our fathers were, to, were towards us, but God's doing this out of his love. And I think it is an opportunity to just recognize that everything he's asking us to remove in our life is because he loves us. And he's like, Hey, did you know there's a better way to live your life? Did you know you could have freedom and just imagine what this would be like? And we, we, we can't see it all the time. We just want to yeah. hold on tightly to those things. And it's true. Yeah. I've been guilty of that for 50 years. Mm. Um, I, I do acquiesce. I would like to suggest I do give him the stuff he asked for. Um, but I've, I've never 
started those stories as a willing partner. <laughs> right. I've always been like, what? Yeah. I have to. Yeah, that's usually I, how I it is. I was raised in the 60s. So, the, you know, uh, I was steeped in, in uh, a few <laughs> different versions of how not to live. And uh, it definitely, he was gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, very kind, mm. led me out gently. So good. Um, I felt like once I was complaining about one of these stories, I felt like once he said to me, all these times you've fallen, was, was I ever harsh? No, mm. you're very kind. Was I ever derogatory or debasing to you in the way that you were struggling? I said, no, never. I think I was kind and gracious to you and helping you find your way. I said, well, certainly. And then I looked at him completely different for the rest of my life. I understood wow. how much he was for me and not against me. And all these hametzes, these leavens in my life were just him helping me. And mm. honestly, you know, he's also so a holy God. He doesn't change. He doesn't fit his, he doesn't love me so much that he'll shape himself around my brokenness. Right. He'll call me to his holiness whether I fit it or not, and then give me the power to fit. Yeah. So to me, this is also remembering how kind it is, how kind and gracious and patient he is as he leads you out of your, your versions of Hametz, your version of sin. Totally. And um, I think there's a, a tremendous failure to present him in the Western church that way. Right. You know, they see him. Some denominations, he's so holy that he's just waiting to bop you over the head with a celestial hammer. Others are so lax that they think he's going to shape himself to your brokenness. And none of those things are true. Right. So right. let me not rave on. I, yeah. uh, I, I can't He help wants but, us to change. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And he, he does it through his love. This? I just, yeah, I, I feel like we could go on about this. This was like a great conversation. Um, but I know we're a little bit over time, so I feel like this is probably a good stopping point um, for at least today's episode. Uh, yeah. Next time we talk, it. next time we talk, uh, we're uh, next going to talk about the Feast of First Fruit. And oh, yeah. I think this will be another great one because it, yeah, it ties right into uh, the resurrection of Yeshua. So Absolutely. Jim, looking forward to our next episode. And thank you to everyone who's listening and following yeah. along. Thanks for listening to the Ancient Way podcast, where our work is made possible by generous supporters like you. To find more podcasts and free resources, we invite you to visit theancientway.org. See you next time.